My name is Anja Wilgopolan. I work in the Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, today we'll go back in time a little bit and learn not only about the animals that are now mostly extinct, but we also will have a closer look at the characteristics of the Pleistocene era. That is, specific conditions on our planet during that period, and uh, also we can uh, you can work on the worksheet I prepared for you. We are not going to work on it on each and every task together, but all the answers you will find in this lessons and lesson, and I will highlight them uh, th those parts too. So, uh, first of all, what is megafauna? Uh, it is associated, and partly it is correct that it is associated with so-called ice age. So, on the right, maybe I can show you that with laser pointer. On the right, uh, you can see the image from animated movie Ice Age, and on the left, still just an image and drawing, a bit more re re realistic. So this is megafauna. Uh, megafauna is a term used in archaeology, paleontology, to describe large animals. And um, the, ma the main criterion is body weight. Uh, there are two mm, limits that are applied, more than 45 kilograms or over 100 kilograms. So those bigger animals are referred to as megafauna. And this term may include subcategories, like that take into account, for example, trophic position of the animal, that is, uh, position in the food chain, uh, like mega herbivores, like deers, uh, mega carnivores, like lions, and less often mega omnivores like grizzly bears. So, uh, megafauna is in the center of interest of paleobiologists who are dealing with Pleistocene because of the massive extinction of large animals in this period. That was like 40 to 100,000 uh, years ago when many species perished during a relatively uh, short uh, period. But this term is also used in description of populations of modern large animals, like elephants, like giraffes, like hippopotamus, rhinos, birds, bisons, um, deers. These are all also um, species that are that form a megafauna. So not only the Ice Age, but also contemporary uh, animals. Let's have a quick look at where, or rather when, we are. So Pleistocene is the geological era, geological epoch, uh, which lasted from about 2,588,000 to 11,700 years ago. And you can already mark this on the scale, uh, on this arrow uh, in the worksheet. And um, it was the world's most recent period of repeated glaciation. And the end of Pleistocene corresponds with the end of the last glacier period. And it can be further divided into four periods, like Gelasian, Calabrian, Ionian, and Terrasian. So you can see that during Pleistocene, this image here, a large part of the Earth was covered with ice, with ice much larger than now, because here we can see the, the image of modern day. So here we are in stratigraphy. Here is the Pleistocene. After that, the, Holo, uh, the Holocene era uh, began. And we live in the Holocene uh, era, of course. Okay. Uh, so how do we know what happened in the past be before any measurement was even uh, possible because humans weren't even present on Earth? So there are at least two keys to the past. First, uh, magnetostratigraphy, and then uh, climatostratigraphy. Magnetostratigraphy uh, teaches us about geophysical correlation. Uh, it is used to date sedimentary and volcanic uh, sequences. It's based on the differences of variability of polarity of Earth's magnetic field. So uh, when some sediment was deposited, Earth poles, Earth magnetic fields was um, had certain uh, certain characteristics, 
And now when we uh, drill this sediment, and we can recreate that. Because the, in this sediment, in, in a rock, there is remanent magnetization, just as it was when the, the rock was, um, was formed, was created. And but then there is also clim climate of stratigraphy. It is used only to quaternary studies, that is, to uh, this recent uh, era, that is, last 2.6 million years. It is based mostly on the observation of sediments of organic debris. And it shows us the nature of plants, animals uh, that, that were uh, on Earth in that, in that time and how it was changed. So in the debris, in layers of sediments, we find remain, remains of certain plants and animals that require certain uh, climatic conditions, which have specific thermal humidity requirements. And this allows us to reconstruct what were the conditions on Earth during that time. And now let's talk about it briefly. What, what, what characterizes uh, the rock and how does it influence fauna, megafauna in this period? First of all, uh, the most characteristic thing is that during this period, the climate changed dramatically, changed very often and, and rapidly. And uh, how do we know that? Uh, because of climate of stratigraphy, we we are able to, uh, just like we are able to get information from ice cores, ice samples, we can have also uh, information from drilling cores, from, uh, for example, uh, sediments in, in, the, in the ocean, in, in the ocean basin. And uh, what we actually uh, are comparing is the content of two isotopes of oxygen. It's, it's so-called oxygen isotope ratio, 18 and 16. There is um, oxygen 18 and oxygen 16, two types of oxygen isotopes. And during glacial periods, uh, the concentration of oxygen 18 in sediments increased. And in interglacial periods, the warmer temperatures uh, when there were more warm temperatures, there is less oxygen 18 and more oxygen 16. So today, these changes provide researchers with accurate data. What were the temperatures like? What were the sea levels like? Uh, what was the volume of global ice uh, uh, like? Because we compare the amount of, or rather a ratio, ratio of oxygen 18 and 16 in so uh, just a quick look at those conditions and climate change in place to stand. So initially, uh, at the beginning of the epoch, there was a strong global cooling. And the northern pole uh, was all covered with the ice cap and there were dramatic changes in plant communities all over the globe. Um, so it was, it was really cold and large part of Earth was covered with uh, ice. Then the, those, there were periods with, there were uh, warm periods, so rapid changes between ice and warm periods, with uh, forests, leaf forests, this uh, deciduous forest, that, that is forests with leaves, uh, that needed more developed, more um, warmer, uh, warmer temperatures, like these trees uh, here. So um, then there was cyclical slice of the ice sheet. So about 900,000 years ago, there was a, such a great cooling that the ice sheet, that the covering of ice, entered lower latitudes. So not only North Pole, but also North America, Europe, Asia, in the Northern Hemisphere. And in the Southern Hemisphere, Argentina, Tasmania, there were covered so totally with ice. So the average temperature, annual temperature, has fallen by 5 centigrade across the globe, uh, comparing to uh, modern annual temperature. Today, the annual mean temperature is 15 degrees, and it was 5 degrees uh, cooler. But nothing lasts forever. 
um, the climate was changing and in less than a million years, and for a geologist it's quite a short time, in the northern hemisphere, uh, the glacier uh, was moving up to 50 or even 40 latitudes and then retreated back uh, to the Arctic. And let's have a look how, uh, how it looked like. So this shows us how the ice cover was uh, retreating and coming back, retreating and coming back. And in general, it was covering a large, larger area than, than nowadays. Okay, this shows us the variability of it. And um, during the maximum spread of the ice sheet, the average annual temperature was about 9, 10, uh, 10 degrees. And the Arctic climate um, had dominated than, uh, all on over one third of the northern uh, hemisphere. But was it always only uh, cooler or colder than uh, nowadays? Not always. Uh, periods of glaciation, when large parts of Earth were covered with uh, ice cover, were divided with, with strong warmings called interglacial. Uh, at the beginning of the Ice Age, they were so-called bimodal, that is, there were very warm periods and not that warm periods. There were very warm periods with deciduous forests and not that warm periods with steppe tundra vegetation. And steppe tundra is a very important term for, for megafauna. So, um, as you can see here on this graph, uh, there were periods when ten, the atmosphere the atmosphere was definitely warmer than today. Today, at zero, we, ha we have modern uh, mean annual temperature, that is 15 centigrade, and it is referred to as a zero point, as a referring point. And here, and here, and here, and here, mean annual temperature on Earth was actually uh, higher than today. So, in Central Europe, there, there was lots of uh, deciduous forests, and very warm demanding uh, plants. So, uh, yes, in the Ice Age, it was possible that it was uh, warmer, for example, in Europe, warmer than today. So, let's go to the main protagonists of our lesson, uh, who are set up in this place of um, rapidly changing reality. So, what was megafauna like? What is megafauna like? Uh, so, we have long lived animals. They live rather long and their, their populations do not grow very fast. They, they grow slowly, but the mortality rate is uh, low. They don't have lots of natural enemies because they are that big, um, so they're not threatened by many predators. And with regard to the low mortality uh, rate, um, it, it is a result from an adopted strategy called K strategy, which is typical not only for megafauna, but also for modern birds, mammals in general. So K strategy is based on a small number of uh, offspring, small number of children. Um, in case of megafauna, it was very, very small, one or two young at once, but extensive care for them. So uh, the, the majority of uh, young ones of juveniles uh, lead to the productive age and con continue to produce other generations. And opposition is a so-called R strategy, so lots, lots, lots of offspring, but not very uh, taken care of, with high mortality and lower reproductive success rate. For, for example, it's the case of fish. Lots of offspring, not many of them survive till the uh, re reproduction age. So, where did the megafauna come from, from in the first place? So, lately, the researchers described the oldest mammal, the ancestor of all mammals. It was very small, it's well, a quarter of a kilogram, looks a bit like a rat, had fur, oval head, and a long tail. Probably it ate uh, insects. And it was described based on detailed genetic research uh, and uh, characteristics of living and extinct animal species. 
So it appeared uh, shortly after the extinction of dinosaurs, probably. It is like 66 million years ago. And this tiny animal has given the origin to more than 5,000 species of mammals walking on Earth, flying, swimming, and including humans. Uh, and this is an illustration. It is not exactly the first mammal. There is not, no such illustration, but a very similar one. But how is it even possible that from this tiny rat, so many megafauna, not only megafauna, mammals evolved from such a tiny creation to the very big one, and humans also. Well, so why did they grow and how did they grow so big? So the record of size in the whole history begins to dinosaurs, to, in general, Mesozoic reptiles. So uh, megafauna is not uh, does not hold the record of size. So uh, even the largest land mammals have not reached the size uh, of the dinosaur, uh, comparing to the T-Rex, uh, for example. But uh, how does it happen? Uh, how does it happen? Uh, the American scientist Edward Cope formulated the rule, and the rule that until today is not very well understood. This means that we do know uh, that it generally works, but we do not know exactly why it works. So the COPE rule, uh, rule says that in general, uh, there is a tendency to increase size by representatives of evolutionary uh, life. And we can confirm this, for example, on the basis of horse evolution. You can see the drawing uh, here. But you know that each and every, uh, not only generation, but later types are getting bigger and bigger. But uh, more simply, we can uh, confirm it on basis of humans. From generation to generation, people generally become statistically taller. And here's a graph that proves it. Uh, There's a median height of a man. Uh, from uh, 1920, uh, sorry, 1820s to the modern times, and we see that generally the tendency is the growth of statistical uh, median height of uh, of men. Uh, so, um, but okay, they they grew so big, but how is it possible that um, the Pleistocene era they survived in Pleistocene era with, for example? Um, big demand for food. They obviously have as such giant creatures. It was possible because uh, of the most important feature of the ecosystem of Pleistocene, and this is, like I mentioned, a very important one: the steppe tundra. It was a steppe tundra ecosystem, which is um, unmatched in any other modern uh, ecosystem. It has a very high primary productivity. That means that the ecosystem produced a relatively large plant biomass cap capable of um, feeding large uh, herbivores uh, and significant diversity species of animals. And if it was uh, possible to feed those giant herbivores, then uh, giant um, predators were able to uh, feed too. So it was because of the productivity of steppe tundra. Uh, so, but if they, if animals in general tend to uh, increase their size uh, with from generation to generation, uh, is it worth it? Uh, because life of a giant is not easy at all. Uh, I'm very tall, and this makes my life uh, rather complicated. So I can imagine that uh, with the megafauna, it's, it was even more complicated. Uh, first of all, why is it, why is it difficult to, to be uh, a giant? What do you say? What do you think? In your worksheet, you also have this uh, part that, that you need to name one, um, one advantage and one disadvantage of being a giant mammal. If you have any ideas, please share them on chat and I will Mm, name some slowly. So first of all, uh, megafauna are mostly, not only, but mo mostly mammals. So their organisms maintain, maintain a constant body temperature. 
this is called hom homothermic. They are homothermic. So their temperature does not depend so heavily on the uh, outside uh, temperature. It is guaranteed by biochemical processes that take place in cells. Circulation of blood return, yeah. Okay, I'll, so I'll, uh, I'll name some of uh, my ideas and then your ideas too. Great, so uh, first, uh, the, the temperature. And if you have a larger body size, that means that more heat is generated and you have a problem of getting rid of too much heat. This is because of simple geometry. The volume of the body grows faster than its surface and the excess energy is removed through the skin. So a giant, like an elephant, has an opposite problem than, uh, for example, a serpent, because serpent must avoid uh, cold and, uh, and elephant must avoid too much, um, too much uh, heat. Okay, for elephant, let's stick to elephant as an example. Every day, the elephant has to consume 200 kilograms of plants to survive. And so most of the time, it has to spend a whole day finding and shredding uh, food. So when you need to constantly get food, you need to constantly chew. And constant chewing requires proper large teeth and jaw. So elephant's head is so big. And uh, because it's so big, it limits the length of the neck because the, length, the neck cannot be too long. It has to support the head. And uh, the elephant is so heavy that he has to be careful not to break his bones while running. So it never gallops or jumps over obstacles. Uh, it manages to run but with sort of uh, mechanical uh, tricks. So uh, their uh, skeleton is uh, rather fragile. It's big, it's heavy, but they need to take, be careful not to, not to break bones. Uh, and, uh, and this is why, for example, it is easier to be a giant animal in water than uh, on land because uh, of Archimedes law. Because the body submerged in liquid loses as much weight as the liquid that pours out. So, uh, it's, so this is why we have a blue whale or humpback whale that weigh 100 or 150 tons, the largest uh, animals ever to have lived on Earth, because they live in uh, uh, in water and they don't have to have to worry about breaking uh, a bone. And another thing is, for example, breeding. So pregnancy, for example, of an elephant or any other large animal, lasts long. In elephants, it's about two years. And as a result, there's one young. So within 50, 70 years, female is able to give like four, five offspring, four or five children. So the population can never be large, and this increases the risk of species extinction, because if there is an unpredictable random event, such as natural disaster uh, or climate change, the, they're not able to produce enough offspring. And yes, coming back to your idea, circulation uh, of blood is, yes, more difficult. And this is exactly uh, what I mean to say in case of mammoths, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. Very good. And uh, so, but since evolution produces giants, that means that somehow it's worth the effort. And there are at least few reasons. Also, please write whatever comes to your mind here. And uh, so while I'm waiting, I'll give you some, uh, some ideas. Um, for example, large-scale body is a form of protection against predators. It just harder to kill a large one than a small one. Of, of course, there is, then the predator gets bigger and bigger and increases its dimensions and it, it, there is a kind of race is beginning. And uh, another thing, and it's quite not that obvious, that larger sizes are beneficial for herbivores mainly. That means mammals feeding on plants. Because they do not have enzymes that would break down cellulose and the cellulose is primary component of plant cell walls so to gain access to the energy contained in it they need 
to break cellulose some, somehow, but they cannot digest it, so they need the help of microorganisms. Some bacteria that ferment cellulose in their in intestines, producing simple fatty acids. Uh, acids. And the greater the volume of the, the digestive system is, the longer it takes the microbes to perform the task. They can do it longer. They can uh, break those cell cells longer. And thanks to this, they can extract more energy from swallowed food, than, uh, which is very low in, uh, in calories. So this is another one. And if uh, anything else comes to your mind, please, uh, please share your ideas as well. I can see you have very... Uh, very good ideas and uh, very thoroughly uh, thought of. So, uh, how about the biggest land mammal ever recorded? So, an absolute record in terms of uh, size belongs to a mammal that actually lived in Oligocene, not in Pleistocene, so be before the era we are talking about. Uh, and it was Imbricoterium, and it was the largest land mammal. His remains were discovered in the beginning of the 20th century. It weighed about 20 tons and the height was about 4.8 meters. The length about 7 meters and they had so those large limbs like my poles and the very large, very large skull. So you can he see here um, the skull and see the uh, size of Indicotherium uh, in comparison with it human, with an uh, elephant, and also uh, with a car, so it was a real giant. So, a uh, place of some megafauna is not that giant, uh, but still quite impressive. So, uh, as for the post-Pleistocene period, we can introduce different classifications on the animals that lived then. Uh, and one of them is based on their position in food chain so-called trophic diversification. So there we have carnivores, predators like cave lion, cave uh, hyena, or saber-toothed cat. And we have herbivores like giant deer, uh, like woolly mammals, like um, mastodon, uh, woolly rhinoceros, musk ox too, and uh, omnivores like cave bear. We can also divide them according to climatic conditions they preferred. So, cryophilic fauna prefers cold climate and is more associated with uh, glaciations, and then thermophilic fauna prefers warmer climate and is more associ associated with interglacials. We spoke about a couple of minutes ago. So, here, all those animals, either omni omnivores, herbivores, or uh, predators, uh, belong to cryophilic fauna. And then we have thermophilic uh, fauna, like straight tusk elephants, Merck's rhinoceros, and aurochs. Um, so, for example, straight tusk elephant um, lives in forests. Its skeleton can be seen in Poland in an ex exhibition in Warsaw. It was actually excavated during some building construction work in Warsaw. And uh, then we have forests. Uh, rhinoceros, so-called Merx rhinoceros. Uh, it was the, the mummified body of it was extracted from the Sula River bed. Um, so it is one of the four existing preserves in the world. So yes, there was time when, for example, in Poland there were elephants and rhinoceros, not only in zoo. And uh, here we we can see the aurochs, and we're going to talk about it. A bit, uh, a bit later. As for this division between cryophilic and thermophilic fauna, you need to remember that there was a, also a phenomenon called mixing of fauna. That in one area there could be warm-loving deer and the cold-loving mammoth, for example. So the division wasn't that strict, wasn't that very, very clear. So, woolly mammoths. Uh, woolly mammoths are, of course, uh, the most famous and largest examples of places in megafauna. Here we can see woolly mammoths. We could say a flagship animal of Pleistocene. And the first thing that comes to your mind, oh yes, Pleistocene megafauna, so woolly mammoths. 
and they were most, most commonly or so depicted in cave art and most commonly hunted. But let's look, take a look at them from a bit different perspective, that is comparing them with their relatives, mastodons. Uh, so they are both relatives of modern elephants, and you can compare them here on this image. So the skull of the mastodon, here is a mastodon, was short and wide, tusks, upper tusks were large and slightly folded. They are more, look, they are more straight than mammals, and less folded than, than mammals. So mastodons uh, inhabited coniferous forests, ate, ate branches, or ate young cones, and Mastodons um, ate mostly leaves, not, um, not, not branches or, or cones. They were uh, similar in size, in their posture, and uh, mastodons were, uh, as you can see here, probably a little bit smaller than woolly mammals, with shorter legs. And uh, one other characteristic that we, you will never ever mistake, uh, make a mistake between the mastodon and woolly mammals, mammals is that mammals also possess this sort of fatty humps on their backs that provided them with uh, additional nutrients necessary with in their most northernly ice-covered habitats. Um, it was a bit like a camel's hump, also a fatty, uh, fatty hump um, providing extra uh, energy. So the, mo the most important thing was, the first thing is the disappearance, but also the food they, uh, they ate. Both animals were, of course, herbivores, but like I said, mastodons have special teeth that uh, allowed them to crush branches and cones, and uh, woolly mammals mostly ate uh, leaves. And uh, also come back to... Uh, the thing you said about uh, blood, um, blood pressure and uh, circul circulation of blood, uh, uh, mammals probably had um, very specific adaptation to uh, first to being a giant and then to cold climate. Because um, when you uh, when you're a giant uh, and you you live in a cold climate. It is very difficult for blood to get to muscles at, at first and, to, and um, the, for hemoglobin to release uh, oxygen because oxygen is released uh, by uh, hemoglobin which transports oxygen in your uh, circular uh, system, in your blood, only when the muscles are very warm because the, um, the brain, uh, we, hemoglobin then knows that uh, yes, you, you must have been running, you need extra oxygen, your uh, muscles are warm, so this is extra oxygen. And when you're, uh, you're, you're that big and um, muscles in your legs are so far away from your heart, first of all, and then when it's so cold, it is very hard to make those muscles um, warm enough to, for, for the oxygen to be released. So they have a, had a special adaptation that allowed hemoglobin to release oxygen in lower temperatures. We could also say that their blood was like a, a winter version of, uh, of fluid, like a winter version of uh, fuel for, uh, that we use in our cars nowadays. Another one is woolly rhinoceros, and uh, it wasn't uh, very difficult to reproduce uh, the appearance of woolly rhinoceros. There were cave drawings with lots of details, but also the whole mummified corpse of the, uh, of the woolly rhinoceros. And the most uh, characteristic thing about it is, of course, it's two, not one, but two carotinous horns on the skull. And it, uh, rhinoceros used it for shoveling in the snow, for finding, uh, for finding food. Uh, now let's pass to a representative of uh, predators among places in megafauna. It's a saber-toothed cat. Um, with, uh, it's also called smilodon. It is the most known kind of it. And now let's take, have, a take, have a look at the photo and its uh, characteristic. What's drawing your attention? First, of course, those giant teeth. But what do you say? What's different? comparing to previously uh, discussed animals. Uh, 
any ideas. They are still mega fauna, but they are much smaller. So why do you think uh, is that? Uh, in general, predators are smaller than uh, than herbivores and their uh, victims uh, because they have to run fast for for their food. First of all, then they don't not. Uh, yeah, the, the vegetation actually was quite uh, qu quite good, and this is how the herbivores survived, and they were victims of those uh, predators. But the predators need to be very fast, and also they don't need to digest cellulose because they eat meat, so they don't need to, uh, their digestion system to be uh, so long. They need to be fast, they need to be very strong, and Snilson was very, very strong. Saber to cat. Uh, is known for the long jaws that were adapted for this tearing and, and biting. Had a very heavy and um, quite strong and heavy skeleton adapted also to hold uh, the giant victim, like for example the mammoth. But what was the reason for their extinction? Well, lack of food because the, of the extinction of larger species it hunted, it, but it couldn't adapt for hunting smaller faster animals because they were it was too big too heavy with too big uh, skeleton and it didn't evolve fast enough to adapt itself for this kind of uh, hunting then we have uh, aurochs uh, aurochs is a very special animal for polish people because the last ever recorded living aurochs died in in poland and it wasn't that long ago because it died in what uh, in uh, 1627, uh, in 17th century, in Mazovia. Uh, and it was the first animal in history of the world that was covered by professional, we could say, uh, protection, environmental protection, protection of species. But it wasn't, it wasn't enough, it, it, was, it was extinct. It wasn't hunted, it was because of the uh, habitat. The, the forests were shrinking because of human activity and it couldn't, uh, it couldn't uh, survive. And uh, it, this is an extinct picture, of course, but it is the ancestor of wild cattle that inhabited uh, Europe. So in a way, it's an ancestor of our cows, for example. And finally, uh, the animal that is a bit more exotic and not only because of its home range it lived in south africa so, sorry south america but most of all because of its uh, bizarre physical appearance you might say it looks a bit like a turtle but it is not a turtle it is a mammal it is glyptodon uh, which was also called a walking fortress its body was covered with a huge armor with thick shields, and in the end, uh, at the end of the tail, there was a sort of a cup, also like almost like a weapon, and the shield also partially covered the head. Here you can see the, the, the remnants and also recreation. It was it was really big. It weighed, weighed one ton, so it really looked like a walking uh, fortress. And we know also that people hunted for him for it for armor, not for food, to use this uh, giant armor as protection, for example, for, for hunters. So, we have this kingdom of uh, well-living megafauna, and suddenly within a short, in general, geological terms, short time, uh, dozens of thousands of years, the megafauna almost disappears from the Earth's surface. And there are at least few hypotheses about the causes of the great extinction. First, there's a hypothesis of violent climate change that was associated with glaciations and interglaciers. Um, so southern temperatures changes, southern temperatures spikes, and um, environmental changes that were too, too rapid. Then there is a, a great killing uh, hypothesis, so-called overkill, that primitive people were settling in new lands, changing their environment, hunting, and the, uh, so the prehistoric Homo sapiens spreading over the continent contributed to extinction of, uh, of megafauna. Then there is the epidemics hypothesis that there were large epidemics, ep episodes, those, that there were pathogens that were harmful to megafauna species, they were so low in reprodu reproduction, remember, and their populations were relatively small that they didn't uh, survive, they didn't 
were not able to reproduce fast enough to replace dying mm, individuals. So um, there are also other theories concerning the disappearance of uh, particular species. For example, mm, based on a survey of 114 mastodons, uh, researchers found that more than half of them had tuberculosis, were sick of tuberculosis, the disease that weak weakened the animals and consequently probably led to extinction. And uh, we are certainly to blame, we as uh, Homo sapiens are certainly to blame for disappearing of wild horses and bisons living in, in Siberia. Uh, so uh, I think Probably it's a mix of all those uh, theories, of all those factors that uh, contributed to megafaunal extinction. And such a huge change, uh, like disappearance of those uh, of megafauna, obviously violated the ecosystem balance. For example, the disappearance of great herbivores drastically changed the composition of vegetation, for example, in, in, in Australia. And we know that uh, Researchers suspect that uh, there were no more herbivores, too much biomass was gathering, too much biomass, biomass was uh, uh, accumulated, and this caused the fires that spread rapidly and destroyed ecosystems. So uh, usually we know that the change in habitat is influencing animal species, but it, in this case it's also the other way, way around. When there were no more large herbivores, the ecosystems were violated uh, too. And some scientists believe that there is no such thing as big places of an extinction of megafauna. Because, for example, mammoths died out in Europe, but other species coexisting with mammoths, like reindeer or musk oxen, you can see here, you can also check this term in Polarpedia, survived the end of the Ice Age and lived to, um, till today in not a very transformed um, form. Uh, and also, it wasn't like that that they just disappeared in one day. It took place in, uh, at the end of place of an epoch, but the disappearance but was also uh, gradual. And uh, so some scientists say it was a natural process and not a sort of a catastrophic extinction. extinction. And uh, to, a little bit of proof of that is that some animals lived in place of then, and they are still with us today like max, uh, musk ox. They were perfectly adapted to Arctic conditions and they were, lived practically unchanged since Ice Age. And some animals did survive the place of an era to the historic times, but not to the present day. And in this case, humans are certainly to, uh, to blame. Uh, this is, a, for, for example, uh, a case of, uh, it's, it's not a mammal, it's a, um, it, it's a turtle, but uh, this, this turtle uh, was certainly killed off by, um, on, on, by Lapita culture in a Vanuatu, uh, in Vanuatu um, uh, island. Uh, for example, moa uh, birds, in New Zealand, the largest known non-flying bird, you can see here, it was reaching up to four meters high. It was extinct not 10,000 years ago, but in 14th century. It was struck by Maori the people arriving in the New Zealand and they were, it was hunted, it was, it was killed for meat. So just to, to, to end our today's lesson, it's just a curiosity. Uh, in, uh, in Russia, in Siberia, uh, Kolima uh, estuary, there's a scientist, Professor uh, Sergei Zimov, who, who is a serious scientist, the head of Northeastern Science Station. Uh, he wants to recreate, to create a place to send park and recreate conditions that were in Siberia in place to send uh, era. He who wants to reproduce the world from over 10,000 years uh, ago, when Siberian plains were full, full of bisons, full of rhinoceros, horses, musk ox, and um, lion, etc. And he is convinced, he has convinced the authorities to dedicate uh, almost 200 uh, square kilometers of land in, uh, around Kolyma River to, to, this, to this purpose. So, and he's bringing uh, herbivores there, like reindeer, moose, horses, oxen, bunnies, marmots, and uh, his idea is that 
it will slow down the uh, climate change because uh, it will slow, uh, it will stop thawing of permafrost and less greenhouse gases will be uh, released. And um, he also thinks of uh, if uh, any time uh, mammoth uh, is cloned, he thinks of bring, cloning and bringing back extinct species, but um, placing them in the park, first of all, it uh, would be morally doubtful and also pr probably quite dangerous. We remember what happened in Jurassic Park uh, movie when uh, extinct animals were brought back to life. So uh, let's watch a short video uh, dedicated to this idea. Okay, so here Professor Rosimov is collecting some money for his project, so uh, we can skip that. Uh, we have a question, how do we know that some of them were woolly, yes, like uh, mammals or woolly rhinoceros, etc. Uh, there are two sources of knowledge. First of all, uh, cave, uh, cave drawings, cave art, as it represents them with detail, because early people were hunting for them, and this was their life, and they were depicting them with such detail that we can, for example, now uh, see the musk oxen that we have now uh, in modern days, that they're exactly like they were in, in those case, the cave drawings. And then in some cases, there are not only skeletons left, but also uh, mummified bodies uh, in permafrost, uh, in, in, uh, wet, in wetlands, and there uh, they also have some of the fur uh, left. So this is how we can recreate, um, so this is how their image was recreated. Now uh, with DNA, um, we can recreate a, a, a lot of, a lot of that, a lot of, a lot more. Uh, it's not only imaging things, but um, simply recreating them, maybe not the living animals, but the, the model of it. Okay, so uh, we're, we're a bit out of time, so uh, I don't see any other questions. Thank you very much for today. Thank you for being with me, and see you next time.